to the Titans of Food Service podcast. This is episode number three. Today, I have an incredible guest. This is an episode that you are not going to want to miss. Dave Lyons is one of the most iconic people in the food service industry. He was originally the president and owner of Food Sales West, which was one of the largest regional brokers in the country. And then he became one of the original architects of the nationwide broker footprint model. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. All right, Dave, welcome to the Titans of Food Service podcast. I'm excited to have you on today. You're someone that I've always looked up to. And, um, you know, I know you've worked closely with my dad for many years uh, at Food Sales West. And uh, as we get into it today, I, I want to learn everything about, you know, how did you get into food service and, uh, you know, what, how did you cut through the noise and get to the top and be successful in food service? So why don't we start off with, how did you get into the food service industry? Great. Well, first, Nick, thanks for having me. I really I was looking forward to this. And as I reminisce for the last 30, 40 years, uh, <laughs> it really brought to light a lot of the things that happened in this business and the changes that have gone through and not only in the brokerage business, but in the food service business. So I'll just give you a quick brief uh, outline of kind of how I got into the business. It was kind of a fluke. I um, actually, after college, I was looking to get into medical sales and uh, which is kind mm -hmm. of a story in itself because I, I'm very queasy and I probably wouldn't couldn't stand the sight of blood at the time. <laughs> and uh, I had the opportunity. I was playing baseball back in Connecticut after college and I met a fellow who was working for Oscar Meyer. My dad introduced me to him and he was on the retail side. And of course, I didn't know a whole lot about food business at that time, what have you. And I ended up going to work for Oscar Meyer on the food service side. And it was interesting because we were a direct sales force. And as I look, you know, mm -hmm. fast forward to 40 years later, I, I, I think it was probably my first opportunity to see the difference and what it meant to have a direct sales force versus a broker force. So and I'll talk about, I'll talk about that quite a bit here during this podcast. But anyway, so I worked for Oscar Meyer for about four years. And uh, at the time I was covering the New England market and I was just basically going, you know, door to door, restaurant, to restaurant, selling their products and you know, very high quality products and uh, certainly mm -hmm. turned over a lot of rocks and had a lot of rejection and kind of learned the sales game. And then from there, I uh, was recruited by Tyson. Tyson Foods was really just a speck on the, on the map. And if you look at what they are today is what they were then. Their food service business was fairly small. And I had the opportunity to go to work as a regional manager. And what that brought to, for me is the um, interaction with food service brokers. You know, I didn't even know what a broker mm -hmm. was. You know, obviously working with Tice or Oscar Meyer, I didn't have that opportunity. So when I, I, I worked for Tyson in New England, I worked with probably four or five different brokers. And I got to tell you, Tyson hired the best. I mean, as you know, um, yeah. in most cases, they hired the number one broker in each market. And I totally. was very, very at a young age, I had the opportunity to learn a lot from them. Um, people like Food Dynamics. I mean, there's some people in New York City, uh, Philadelphia, some some major markets. So I learned a lot about how the, the brokerage business worked and not knowing that I was going to get into the business you know, later on. So anyway, after I uh, went to work for Tyson, uh, I guess you could say I married into the family of the brokerage business. And uh, Carl, Carl Scharfenberger had started a business in California and he was quite successful. And he called me out of the blue one day and says, hey, I need you to come up and work me. I, I know you, I'd like you to work for me. So I, uh, I left Tyson and I went to work in Northern California and I spent uh, probably about five years in Northern California and learning the business. And I got to tell you one thing about Carl, you know, and as you sure. well know, and I know your dad knows very well. You know, Carl kind of set himself, set himself apart from a lot of the, the other food service brokers. First of all, we were an ESOP company, employee-owned company, which was very unique mm -hmm. at the time. And I wrote down some of the benefits on that. You know, I think it, it brought together, you know, I think there was a family environment and there was a, as the old commercial, the piece of the rock. Everybody felt like they had a piece of the rock and they were performing for not only themselves, but for the company. And and, and they were rewarded and they were rewarded every year by profitability. If the company did well, they would get shares of stock, ESOT stock. Now, it wasn't voting stock. I mean, it wasn't like they could uh, raise cane like some people do today, but it was very unique. And I think that kept a lot of people. Our turnover was minimal. We had a family environment. Um, I think that, uh, you know, outside of that, Carl brought in other resources. I mean, you know, we had a 
we had an a, a attorney, a lawyer attorney, Italian company, who not only brought financial uh, information and financial knowledge to the business, but he also brought a lot of mm-hmm. consulting, uh, being that he had he had talked to, he had worked with other companies, not only food companies, but and Carl was always ahead of the game, always ahead of the curve. And the big thing is with Carl was relationships, and I can't tell you, you know, how much that meant to me. You know, it was he was always stressing relationships and also hiring the best people. And I think this is probably one of the things that really made us successful is, you know, we hired the best. We hopefully paid them a little better than most other brokers at the time, had the opportunity to incentivize them with bonuses and ESOT, 401k plans. But it really came down to, you know, them performing and we just get out of the way. And I think, uh, as you well know, being in the business today, if you hire somebody, you want them to do the job and you don't want to be riding over their shoulder and, you know, you know, it's 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 interesting because when I went back my Tyson days, I learned a very key lesson, and it came from Don Tyson of all people. Um, mm-hmm. And you know the Tyson uh, tradition. You know when I worked in, I actually spent four years in Arkansas working for Tyson, and I uh, the khaki shirt was the was the norm back then. Everybody wore a khaki shirt with their name <laughs> on, and I had mine with Dave, and Don had his with Don, and Don was the chairman CEO of the company. And I'll never forget, mm-hmm. he, he caught me in the hall one day and we were talking about a situation and I told him what had happened. And he said to me in his Southern drawl, he said, Dave, do never, never be afraid to take a risk. He says, if people do make mistakes. It's going to happen. Just don't make the same mistake twice. And I think from that day on, I kind of like learned that. that, you know, some people are afraid to take a risk, whether it's in business or in life. And it's so important that you uh, you take that chance. And I, I learned it from, from one of the the top industry leaders. So it was a, a lesson that I'll never forget. So anyway, so back to uh, Food uh, Sales West, um, you know, I, I'll kind of go through the business, how it was in, in the 90s. You were just a young pup. You probably don't remember it. But uh, <laughs> business in the 90s was booming. I mean, it was it was it was a free for all. I mean, principals were hiring at, at a fast pace. Lines were coming fast and, and, and easy. Sales were growing 15, 20, 25 percent. It was a great time. Um, you know, and why do you think that was? Well, the economy was good for one. I think also, okay. I think if you look at the food service business, there was a ton of expansion. I think you know, back in the day, and I don't have the percent, but there was always this percent, you know, retail sales were, you know, so much 70 percent food service. And people were going out. There was the work, you know, the working women. There were, you know, you, the, 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 everybody was working. People were eating out all the time. Restaurants were expanding, sure. not only independents, but chains. Um, it was just an incredible time. I mean, it was, it was a great time. But, but with that, manufacturers were trying to keep up with it. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was hard to do was, um, you know, for, for, uh, produce new products. And, you know, we had... I think one of the things that was key to us, we had, we had specialists, and this is something that Carl had started, but we had specialists in the chain in, uh, K-12, you know, the school side, non-commercial. Sure. And this was, mm-hmm. this, this was a, um, a kind of a, 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 a real plus for us because it gave us expertise and we had people that were focused in that, that particular area. And when they, were getting, when they were working with their customers, the relationships that they built were, were phenomenal. And they had, and it wasn't only from a sales side, but there was a lot of product development, menu development. And I, I know there's a lot of cases where customers, and I'm talking about the operator customer today, would suggest to the manufacturer, can you mm-hmm. do this product? Can you make this particular type of product? And so that was, that was exciting. And uh, I think that, you know, those days, you know, lasted probably until, of course, the early 2000s when we got into some tough times with the economy and whatever. Um, and I, 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 I'm looking at a couple of things because um, I, the also during that time, there was lines that were coming and because of the people we hired, um, you know, there were some key lines. And I think everybody in the brokerage business wants to have the full portfolio, you know, whether it's protein and starch and desserts and all that. And we always had some voids. You know, I think there were voids all the time, but we, we, we had a great ability to go after principals that we needed. And in some cases, we would actually hire. In fact, you have an employee that sure. today that thanks to Khan, you know, we were able to pick up Simplot, which was a, a very large potato line and, uh, you know, one of the dominant mm-hmm. potato companies in the, in the country. 
So we were, we were, we were very, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, that was very satisfying for us. Um, the other thing I was going to mention during that time was Carl, you know, as far as learning and best practices, we were members of the food service group. And back then, food service group was one of those national broker networks. And it's funny because they had a product called Foodcom, which today, if you look at technology, it was probably as ancient as, you know, the, uh, it, 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 it could be. <laughs> But it helped us and it, it, we shared ideas. We were able to meet a couple times a year and obviously talk on the phone, but we always talked about best practices. And that's something that Carl preached was how do we improve ourselves? He probably had the best Definitely. technology platform. And I say we, Food Sales West at the time, we sold it. We actually sold the technology to other brokers. That's how good it was. And it kind of led the charge because it was all about information. And the more information we could provide not only our manufacturers, but working with our distributors and operators, what, what a benefit that was, you know? And I think that was a key to his oh. success and key to Food Sales West. And that te technology today has just gone, you know, expanded dramatically in every, every there's not one company that can be successful without, you know, it, yeah. And, and it, you know, as far as uh, let me, lines uh, coming and going, we, we did have one, I call it a kind of a kick in the, you know what, uh, but during that same time, there was a, a company, Quaker Oats Tropicana, that was owned by, that became uh, part of PepsiCo. And at the time, mm -hmm. they represented probably about 14% of our revenue. And we got the call wow. on, yeah, a, a significant amount of revenue. And uh, anytime you, you talk in uh, any, any revenue losses is, is significant, but that was very significant. And they, they made a decision to go direct. PepsiCo was a direct sales company. And so when we heard the news, Obviously, we were shocked, uh, but we huddled up and we decided, you know, we're going to get through this. Uh, we didn't let anybody go during sure. that time. We kept everybody on board. Uh, we might have cut some salaries at the higher level, if I recall. But at the same time, we said, you know what, we're going to do our best. We're going to do everything we can. We've got to work together as a team to get this revenue back. And within 12 months, less than 12 months, we had replaced that revenue. And a lot of it was with wow, lines like, tight, like uh, Simplot. Uh, Nestle came aboard, you know, not too long after that. And it was just a, it was kind of a, a tribute to the way the, the brokerage works because, you know, without it, without the relationships and without the performance, we would have never been able to get that done. So definitely it, when you lost Quaker Oats, you know, being 14% of your revenue, you, you know, you said it, it took about a year to get back to, you know, to get all of the commissions back <clears throat> in that year time was, was food sales West still a profitable company uh, or was it running more break even or losing money? How did that look? Well, great question. Um, after that, when that happened, I would say we came probably very close to break even, you know, maybe a, a couple of percentage points, you know, in the, in the, in the black, but it was, um, it was tough and we, we tightened everything and we tightened expenses. As you know, one of the things about, you know, our company, we weren't afraid to spend money. We actually spent money, you know, entertaining quite a bit. We spent money traveling. Um, we go to you know broker advisory board meetings, which is another huge thing. And that's another thing I want to point out is the importance of you know BACs. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on four or five, and I'm sure you have been yourself. But there's there's so much sharing of information that goes on at those meetings, and you know, and every market's unique. It's funny. Everybody always to poke poke fun at the California market. You know, talk about the granola steak, flakes, fruits, mm -hmm. and nuts. But I tell you, we had a unique style, <laughs> and it and it was nothing. It wasn't like any other market. You know, California had sure. its own way of doing business and and we shared our our best practices with other brokers and other brokers. And we picked up a lot. Um, but I think that at that revenue, it was funny what you, you mentioned as far as the loss of revenue. I happen to be in a taxi cab with another legend in the industry, a fellow by the name of Tommy Lott. Tommy Lott was a broker down okay. in Texas and I was in the back of a cab and I had just shared the the, uh, the story with to with Tommy that we had lost Tropicana. And he, he saw mm -hmm. my, he saw how, how upset I was. And he looked at me, he says, Dave, he says, don't worry about it. Lions are going to come and go. He says, you lose it, mm -hmm. you go out and get another one. And another, once again, I was a right. young, young, young kid at the time. And, uh, but it kind of rang a bell. It's like, you know what? You are going to lose lines. Things happen. There's consolidation. There's, you see what happens in the industry. We've lost lines that we never expected to lose for the craziest reasons. Totally. And it wasn't all about performance. So, yeah. Yeah. So that was, but that was, that was then. So then we kind of moved into the, 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 the millennium. 
and things changed dramatically. Uh, not only did revenue, uh, there were revenue reductions, broker reductions, which was unique to us. And I think one of the things you know, we want to talk about is we probably, during the good days, we were probably four or 5% average brokerage in the 90s. Well, that number got reduced dramatically in the 2000s, you know, during the, during the tough economic times. I would say some of our bigger lines that were 4% were probably closer to 2%. Well, of course, we couldn't do as oh, much, wow. you know, and that was these are some tough of conversations course. we had to have with our manufacturer. Um, you know, we and it, difficult. You know, we we were always monitoring the number of calls, number of presentations we made. But it was difficult yep. because we said, you know what, your, your, your revenue has been dramatically cut. At the same time, we were looking to ways to, you know, to improve or to replace that revenue. And I think that's at the time where things came about. We were looking at deli opportunities. We were looking at Costco. We were looking at every everything out of the box, you know, other than food yeah. service, you know, and you know, you've, you've, you've done this yourself. Um, I think the other thing was you had a thing called slotting allowances. And, you know, this, okay. was, this was interesting because during the 90s, we never had slotting allowances. But now because things were tougher, everybody was looking at their inventory, especially on the distributor side. All of a sudden, this new concept called slotting allowances came aboard. And manufacturers pushed back, but it was a tough call because we have two customers. We have our operator customers and distributor customers, and we have our principals, which are customers. Okay. And so when it came about, the, the operator customer was asking us to get a product to them. And many times we had pushback from the sure. distributor that they would not bring the product in. We would go to another distributor. Well, then we got into a little fight with the distributor saying, well, that's our customer. We always had that rat mm -hmm. Well, women, we didn't know you own the customer. Since when is that? You know, the customer is it's everybody's customer. But that was a tough call. Sure. And then we, then we at the same time, another another term I thought of was came about overlaps. We started to pick up lines that were similar, not exactly the same, but maybe in the same category. It might be another type of cheese, uh, might be another kind of a pizza sauce. It could be, you know something else, but we, we had what we call overlaps. And in most cases, Nick, we were able to sell overlaps as long as we perform. The key thing was performance. And when we didn't perform, obviously that conversation was more difficult. Of course, of course, kind of, I, I think maybe the concept of, uh, you know, like a hard conflict versus a soft conflict, you know, I think with the brands that <clears throat> we represent currently, there might be, you know, your core items might be something, but maybe you have secondary or, or third, uh, you know, less focused items uh, that might, you know, be a, in conflict with somebody else. But if it's not their main focus, then it's not, you know, sometimes the manufacturer says, you know, I, I can I can coexist with this other brand. That is fine. Exactly. Yeah. In some cases, they're, they're fine with it. In some cases, they're not. Of course, the other thing is you've got, we had at the time, a lot of new companies. That's the other thing. A lot of a new, new, new companies coming up and everybody wanted to get the same attention. Sure. And as you know, they'll come into you and say, well, I'll pay you. You know, and we weren't big on guarantees, but there, you know, where we did have a line that paid us minimal amount of revenue and they wanted a lot of attention, a lot of time. We would have those tough mm -hmm. conversations, say you're only going to get so much time. You know, when you have a Tyson totally. and a Simplot and Nestle, you know, there's, they have to get the majority of the time along with the other folks. So those are tough, but it, I think- Is there a, is there a minimum that you would look at in terms of revenue or commission size in order to take on a brand or was it a different scenario for each manufacturer? I think it was different for each manufacturer. It, you know, it, it wasn't so much, it, it, we also looked at it from the volume and also the, the, uh, the channels that they would sell. If we knew that mm -hmm. we could sell a particular product to a channel, be it a, a K-12, uh, where that was focused right. in a product, and we know we could get, you know, turn a lot of volume. The revenue, the, the, the percentage wasn't as great. Of course, we fought for as much as we could get. And it also came back to the, the sales effort. What did it take to get the business? You know, we had conversations about bids. That was another thing we had. We were very good in the bid department. You know, we had a great, you know, great technology for monitoring bids. And mm -hmm. as you well know, you know, if you get a, a, a high volume opportunity and it only takes, oh, yeah. you know, a couple of phone calls, you're not going to get paid the, the, the revenue that you normally would. So, yeah, that, that was totally. something that we talked about. But um, I think all in all, it was interesting because 
as we got into the, re the regionalization, I'm going to bring this up because Carl actually started to regionalize in California in the 80s. As I mentioned, I worked up in Northern California. And then when I moved down to Southern California, eventually took over the business in the late, eight, in late 90s. But that was kind of the start of regionalization. And it was interesting because what it did, it centralized certain um, things like accounting, uh, you know, and, and what it did, it drove some cost out of certain markets that you could put into sales. And this whole regional process, that's what the, the benefits, and I, I thought about this last night, was you know, it, as we expanded, and I'll get into some of our expansion in the, in the, in the mm -hmm. millennium, but it really helped because um, you know, principals are always looking for more time, more selling time. You know? And so mm -hmm. the only way you can give it to them is by taking something away that was a cost to your business. And whether it was administration or whether it was uh, yep. you know, accounting, office expense, what have you. So that was important. And I think the regionalization really, that, that, that kind of got everybody going because as we expanded into other markets, and I'll start, I think around late 90s is when we really took off. And the, region, the, the, the beauty, I go back to when I was with Tyson and I talked about you know, how I met several brokers and I was fortunate because most of the brokers I knew, I knew just about every one of the Tyson brokers I had worked with. Sure. Them. And on the West, I knew them very well. And it was very, very, it was much easier when we went to acquire a company, take a Jim Corey in Arizona right. or a Dick Wyam in, um, in Nevada and what have you. But we had conversations and we knew each other. We respected each other. We knew each other's business. And it was a lot easier at the time to, and when you have a company like Tyson and in some cases Simplop, we had a lot in common. So the regionalization it came play place and we, we acquired about probably six new markets. Uh, I mentioned Washington, Oregon's another one, Utah, Idaho. Um, sure. And so it, during the course of probably three, four years, we had, we had added about five or six new companies, which of course put, added a lot of stress on the business, but it also helped us centralize. We drove out all those costs in those markets that we talked about, went mm -hmm. down to Southern California headquarters, and it really helped make me in other markets. We were basically a sales organization. You know, we didn't have to worry about, we didn't have to worry about the admin. We didn't have to worry about, you know, all that other stuff. And so it was, it was, it's really great. And, um, I think that, you know, the people we got, uh, we, we were fortunate because they're all leaders in the industry. And at the same mm -hmm. time, now principals are kind of taking note, you know, a lot of principals who were in single market and you have the single market principal. And, but we were able to expand and have several of our principals, not only Tyson, but we, we were able to, you know, acquire them in, in not, not all markets, most of our markets, you know, six out of seven or five out of seven. And that was cool. Um, of course, once again, all of a sudden the demands, the revenue goes up and they look at you and they, the microscope comes out. And that's where you really need to have strong leaders because we, we would have a brand manager that would you know, obviously work like you do with, with each manufacturer. Mm -hmm. But it's important that you communicate on a regular basis. I mean, we were talking constantly. You know, we had meetings at headquarters Correct. because this whole regional thing, they really didn't understand it. They weren't sure because they were most 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 manufacturers were used to. I want the best broker in each market. Well, I'm not saying we necessarily, you know, we may not have had so-called the best broker in some eyes in each market but it comes back to you know, you know doing the right thing and our performance level and, and we did very well with that concept and i think um you know what it did is not only did it uh we we were able to pull resources you know when you have a company and i think we got up to at one time about 175 employees and we wow, can pull, that's, a, that's yeah at our, at our maximum and uh but we were able to take employees if we needed it we we're doing sales blitzes or food shows or whatever it may be. And it was kind of neat. The mm -hmm. other thing, it gave opportunities for people to grow. We had several employees that moved to other markets, you know, and in a single oh, market, wow. they may not have that opportunity. And we had several that moved, you know, from California to Washington or to Utah or Las Vegas. And so that sure. was, that was kind of a, that was, that was a real plus for the regional side. And, you know, I think um, as we get into it, you know, of course, as we get through the, 2010, 2011. Now you got the interest of some retail brokers, and I don't. I don't know if you have any questions regarding the the regionalization. Yeah, I do. Uh, well, well, first, when you were in the brokerage business in the '90s, what did the uh, you know competitive set look like? Was it a lot of 
in local market independent brokers or was there very little competition? What did it look like in the 90s? Uh, it was it was mostly local independent brokers, very strong. And I'd say in most cases, sure. there were probably three or four independents in each market. And uh, and I think that, you know, that it was it, it was um, it was a struggle. I mean, every market, I'd say yeah. in Northern California for us, because we were fairly new, uh, we probably there were probably two other powerhouse brokers. And I don't want to go into all the details, but there was a, dr a dramatic happening that happened back in the late, late nine eighties. And it's one of the reasons I left Tyson to come into the business, but it was, um, very competitive. Uh, most companies, I'd say most manufacturers would stick with their broker. I mean, things were once again, if business was good, it was very hard to pull a line away. Um, we had a lot of conversations and of course, you know, as we try to grow, in Northern California, because we went through a period where we had lost a few lines because of a transition that took place, but we were able to replace them pretty quick. But it was it was it was it was hard. It was hard to get lines. I mean, you really mm -hmm. and the lines you had, you you gave them all the time you could. You, you did everything you could to grow their business and you know meet their meet their goals and you know their their numbers. Right. But that's uh, you know. But then I think that's the thing, and that was that's probably the hardest thing for Princeton was to. There were several that in the even when we started regionalization that were totally against it. Uh, Windsor was one of them. Windsor, which was a very large company, totally opposed yeah. to you know regionalization. Uh, they said we have the best broker in each market, and it took us a while to really you know show them the benefits and you know show them that our performance levels were higher than what they were getting from their independent broker. Oh wow. But there's still a lot of pluses. Um, but the independent broker, hey, there's still some strong brokers out there, independents. And, you know, I think they, they paid attention to their business. The ones that kind of took their eye off the ball and maybe didn't grow and I think didn't, didn't invest in technology. Technology was so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first question you oh, get in sure. an interview is what, what's your, techno, techno, your platform for technology? What do you do for your bid process? You know, this and that. And if you didn't answer those questions, you know, most principals weren't even going to listen to you. Oh, one hundred percent. I know. You know, we still see that nowadays. It's, um, you know, the technology is different now here in twenty twenty two versus the nineties or early two thousands. But it, in many cases, you know, especially having like a CRM tool, it's a prerequisite. You, that, that's just the starting point, and you have to have other things on top of that as well. Absolutely. When you you mentioned a few times having, uh, you know, your, your people were leaders. Uh, you always like to hire the best when you went and try to find, you know, new employees and new team members, what did you look for in people or, or was there anything specific? <sighs> well, yeah. First thing was we wanted somebody with experience, food service experience. We hired, we did hire people that didn't have any food service experience. And it was, it was difficult because there was a lot happening. And I mean, <laughs> you know, there are sales people, excuse me, excuse me. There are salespeople and, and there were, you know, but when we, I'd say majority of our employees were, were hired, you know, had been in the food service industry. And the other thing was we liked, you know, we, we, we hired manufacturer people. Uh, a lot of the manufacturer, they want to get off the road. You know, they're looking to uh, do something different. Um, so in some cases that backfired on us as well. You know, we, and so, you know, we try to have the conversation and say, you know, it was, it was a mutual agreement, but it's always our fault if we took somebody. But yet when the manufacturer stole a brokerage or something from the broker, it was never our fault, never their fault. And that happened too. So it goes of both course. ways. But yeah, we look for people that had sales experience, uh, somebody that a self-starter. We wanted people that mm -hmm. could get out there and just, you know, right from day one, get out and put the bootstraps on and go out and sell. Um, from a management side, I, I was very fortunate. I, I was able to hire some key managers. And I think in, with, with, with the companies we purchased, we got some very high quality people. Um, you know, I think, you sure. know, if you look around and the, the people that ran these companies were, were top notch all the way. Um, but it was, uh, you know, we made mistakes. We hired some on a whim and, totally. you know, we thought that uh, it would work out. And, and it's a tough business. A lot of folks, a lot of them they couldn't mm -hmm. handle it. They couldn't handle the... You know the day to day, the number of calls have to make, and that was the other thing. We were we managed them. There was you know they they managed themselves, but we had to manage them. And there were certain criteria, as you know, they had there was the things they had to do. We had call reports. There were some people that didn't like doing input. We had 
you know, um, yep. situations where we had to fire people because they, they wouldn't do input. Um, but you get the right, it's sooner or later, you know, when you get the right person, you know, it, it, it yeah. made a difference. Did you ever hire people or, or back in the nineties and the two thousands, did people, were there certain individuals that be, you know, have a really tight relationship with a line and you could hire them on and they, they'd bring that line with them? Yes, that, that was something we did quite often. And, uh, in some cases, I'd say most cases it worked in some cases it didn't, um, in the case of you know, Khan, we might talk about Simplot, you know, that that was one mm -hmm. that was successful. We were able to pick up Simplot and which was a huge line for us. And uh, we were able to get Khan's expertise. And obviously, you know, he knew potatoes better than anybody. But at the same time, sure. we, uh, we we tried it with another person. We were hoping, you know, in Southern California, to pick up a major line. Uh, we hired the individual who was the region manager, but yet they they held their ground. And it took mm -hmm. it for probably two years. And it took about two years before we were able to actually, you know, obtain the line. But yeah, we did. And I think that was the other thing. If we, we went after, a, let's say, a key person, a top management person who was making a, a, mm -hmm. a high salary and they want to come to work for us, we would, it was very difficult because we had certain criteria and we couldn't pay everybody, you know, the big bucks. But we would say, mm -hmm. if you could bring a line with you or your company or whatever, and that, it, and that happened, we were able to get some people that, brought, you know, revenue to the party and helped defray the cost of, you know, for their, their expenses. And the, I mean, their salary. That makes sense. Yeah. And then you said there was a three to four year period where you went out and bought five or five or six, uh, uh, uh other brokers and other markets. How did you structure those deals? And, did, and what, what was it that you look for when, you were trying to buy these companies. Was that, it maybe they, that they had Tyson or similar lines? How, how did that all work? Great question. In fact, that's part of my notes right here. I just looking at, um, yeah, first things first, you know, obviously Tyson being our number one line, if that was our kind of our, our first, if that was an opportunity, that was the first company. And I said earlier, in many cases, you know, the Tyson brokers had a pretty good mix with us. I mean, their lines matched mm -hmm. ours, not always. And that was, a, that was the tough part. So let's, Let's take a situation, you know, like, like um, we take Arizona, you know, where Arizona had Tyson and Lamb Weston, we had Simplot. And so what we would mm -hmm. do, and, and this happened in most markets because we didn't match up in every market, obviously, but we would talk right. about, you know, we knew that we were going to lose that particular competitor. I mean, if that was, you know, whether it was you know, Lamb Weston, we, we know we weren't going to get them. We would figure mm -hmm. that into the equation. And what we would do is, first of all, we looked at the performance of the company. And most of the, most of okay. today, the most financials were based on EBITDA. And we looked at EBITDA. And of course, most owners, especially some of the old timers, they had a whole different feel about their, their earnings and, you know, what their company was worth. And, and it was, <laughs> I could laugh now because I know as a young guy, we used to go into markets and say, well, this is what we're willing to pay you. And they look at us like we had three eyes and say, well, I'm worth this. And we'd say, how do you figure that? So I think that, you know, fortunately, the financial world got a lot savvier and you know, we, we, it, it, people came to grips with really what their, what their company was really worth. And so we would structure mm -hmm. it based on EBITDA. And we also look at future growth and not only future growth based on the lines they had, but also lines that were going to be going away. And if we knew mm -hmm. that they were going to lose, let's say, 15% of the revenue based on conflicts, we would then factor that mm -hmm. in the equation. We, and we were very fair about it because we, you know, we, we were basically, we were trying, sure. not, the, the important thing was to get the bigger lines and also just to get, the, get, get their business so we can regionalize and be in a new market because we knew we were going to grow. Of we course. knew we were going to expand and get other lines in the marketplace. But um, so we would, we would structure it like, you know, as far as that goes. And then the payouts would be depend on how long the principal owners or owner wanted to be there. If an owner said, an older okay. owner said, I want to be out in two years, then we would make that payout. We'd accelerate it. It'd be a faster payout. We may not pay as much because of the the, the, the dollar amount and whatever and what the dollar would be worth. But in situations where the, the principal owner wanted to stay on, in some cases, five years, 10 years, um, sure. we would pay a long term and we'd pay more for the business because we've had the beauty. Now, we also put a clause in there. Most of our, our buyout, our purchase agreements had a clause that said, if you lose revenue, we would adjust it up to a certain period. So we might have a 12 month period because 
you know, you don't know how people are going to react. You know, you know a principal could say, you know what? Yeah, we're, you know, they could tell you in your face that, you know, we're happy with this. And then three months later, they turn around and said, we, we don't like this. But in all cases, yep, I mean, every sense. one of them, I think that if you ask the people that we bought, they were very satisfied. Obviously, they became part of the ESOT. They, uh, you know, so mm-hmm. they, they shared in the ESOT and in, in we the payouts were made on time. Everybody got their payout. And in ca- some cases where, where they own their own building, they also they kept the income. We did not buy the, the buildings. You know, that was theirs. If we ended up, they'd have the lease on the building. Mm-hmm. So they were able to get that revenue stream and continue with it, which which helped a lot of people oh, make a nice. lot of money. Yeah. Did you require that the 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 previous owners stay in the business or was there some cases where they said, I just want to be out immediately? Uh, the majority will stay in. I think the majority would, would stay in at least for three years. Um, we okay. had, a, we had one that wanted to get out within a year and that was, you know, and, but they also had a good bench. They had a good management team, you know, so they had other senior okay. managers there. So, you know, we were a little concerned, but, you know, it really came back and we were, you know, we were, we were trying to be as fair as possible. We never said to somebody, Hey, we want you to stay on for three years or five years. That was their call. Um, ideally, mm-hmm. uh, some probably stayed on longer than we wanted, you know, but you know, in the long run, it, it all worked out, but, uh, we were fortunate because we, and I said, I think going back to relationships, it was so, cause I, I, I happen to know all these people very well. And some, you know, I'd worked with them before sure. some I had worked with, you know, in, not only in, in the manufacturing business, but in the broker's business. So the conversations mm-hmm. were a lot easier. Um, I know in talking to other brokers around the country, and I'll, I'll get into how we got into the Waypoint thing, but you know there was, there was a lot more of a struggle in other markets because I don't think people right. had the relationships and line conflicts. There was some, it was very difficult. Right. I mean, we, we, we actually tried to buy companies in, in, in our own markets, like in Northern California, but there was so yeah. much conflict that you, by the time you washed it out, you, you, it, it was a, not a viable you know, opportunity. So we'd walk away from it. Right. Right. That makes sense. Um, so let's get into nationalization and, you know, kind of the creation of Advantage Waypoint. Who were some of the early people in those discussions uh, or maybe why was, you know, this finally coming to the forefront? What kind of spurred this whole nationalization movement? Well, I think when we were going through the, the early 2000s, as I mentioned to you, people were looking for revenue opportunities. It was also the retail right. brokers. And I know two came to light, two came to uh, my attention. Uh, the first one that actually contacted me was Acosta. And at the time, of course, I, I had no interest. And then Advantage came in and it, they were all doing the same thing. You know, retail business had, you know, all the, right. you know, it, it, everything was re- broker reductions. They're all looking for the same thing. How do we grow our business? How do we get new revenue, new revenue and whatever? And, you know, I think the whole thing was, you know, how these were, these were national companies. I mean, Acosta, right. Advantage, they were already national retail and there were a couple others, uh, Benchmark and what have you. But mm-hmm. in these conversations, I think at the same time, we as a regional broker, were always talking to other regional brokers around the country. There were probably seven, seven six or seven others that we were very close to. Um, you know, Buddy Taylor down in Florida and uh, mm-hmm. Mascari up in Detroit and Mick Asmussen in Chicago, uh, New England. And, you know, we, but we had we had talked and we all said to ourselves, now that we've grown up, what do we want to be when we when we really grow up? Because we had become these regional brokers right. and there really was not a lot, a lot, or no other place to go. You know, we had kind of mapped out right. our own deal. and We didn't want to step on everybody's toes. And the manufacturer was saying, hey, you're grown, you're grown enough. You know, we, we don't want you going into the markets. Although we had we had some people ask us to go to Alaska and go to Hawaii, and we weren't we able we weren't able to ever pull that off, except for a little bit in Alaska. Yeah. But so those companies uh, came to us, and I think at the time we said, you know what, maybe it's it's time to talk to them. And uh, hmm. and I think we we finally so we opened up. We I had actually Sonny King, who was the chairman uh, of of Advantage in down in Newport Beach, your area called me one yep. day and says, Hey, let's, let's get together for lunch and let's talk. And of course I had known a little bit about his business, but I didn't know a whole lot. And we had a very interesting conversation. And basically he said to me, he says, I want to, I want to get into food service. And he says, I've done research on your company. He said, I know what a good job you do. And he says, um, if we have an opportunity to talk, I'd like to do that. And so that was kind of the, the premise, how we got started. And then from there, there were conversations that I had with some of the other brokers. We were part of a, you know, mm-hmm. organization. I think there was a tie and we also, 
because we had kind of known each other, we had met at different broker functions, you know, whether it was the mm -hmm. NRA or what have you. So we told, we would have these conversations and there's always, there's this, we, we talked about coast to coast and it was just kind of like a, a thought if we could ever come together as coast to coast brokers. Well, this was our opportunity. So we had a meeting and we had two or three other brokers got together with Sonny King and myself and we met in Tampa. And then the conversation started to heighten and uh, Sonny showed that he was very interested in it. At the same time, Acosta caught wind, as they all do. There's no secrets in this business, but they knew that, <laughs> you know, course. they were going after it. So they started the trend and they started calling people. They called and they came back to us. And of course, we were already in conversations with the Advantage folks. And, uh, you know, it wasn't it took probably a good nine months to a year from the first conversation to really, you know, put, put something together. And even then, um, you know, I had my concerns. I think you well know this and I know John does, mm -hmm. um, because of our company, we are the, because of the fact that we are a, a ESOT, our, our culture, you know, our, our culture was such that we were, we were very close and I felt like we might be you know, giving up something, but right. And at the time there, <laughs> There was pressure on all sides. Um, there was pressure from some of the principals because the, some of the key principals, you know, there were a couple that were all for this. They were actually mm -hmm. pushing it. They wanted to see this national roll up of sorts. And yet there were others that we knew that they were totally against it. So it was going to be like, OK, well, who if we do this, who's going to stay? Who's going to go? And how is it going to impact our business, you know, our financials and everything else? And obviously our people. How is it going to impact our people? Right. So. <laughs> So as we got down the road, you know, we decided, OK, we're going to do this. And uh, basically the, it was done in a couple the, the financials were done in a couple tranches. And it was done that um, we would have our own independent businesses. We would continue to run as independent people, but mm -hmm. we would be under the auspices of Advantage Waypoint. And so Advantage okay. was, and they would provide certain resources. We continue to use our own technology platform and all that for a while. But. So when it happened, mm -hmm. the the headquarters, everything was rolled up into Tampa, um, you know, Food Dynamics down there, or not Food Dynamics, but Buddy Taylor's company. Um, and at the time, the bet, what happened was we were actually, we were able to pull a lot of the um, find, uh, resources and put it and consolidate them and centralize them down in Florida. All accounting went down there. Mm -hmm. um, your, um, some of your uh, back of the house operations, even the sample process. We we had a program for samples that was done on a, on a, out of one office, um, and so it it it, re, it eliminated redundancies, which is what it did. And I think that's mm -hmm. the the thing what, when you look at regionalization, Nick. That anytime you can eliminate something, you're duplicating. You know that that's a win win. You know, obviously you're, you're putting yeah, money course. you're putting money where it really counts, and that's on the sales side. So I could say that you know it was it was a it was interesting because we we knew each other, but one of the problems that I had with it is we had different cultures. And I think right. when you look at you look back, and although I feel like it was the right move at the time, um, and the company's you know, done very well. I mean, they, they're very successful and what have you. They've had you know obviously their their, their hits and what have you. But I think that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it gave us an opportunity to once again give people an opportunity to grow. Uh, of course, right. the, the size of the company grew tremendously because now we were crossing state lines and what have you. But mm -hmm. it, it um, we also started what we call a top to top, which we are now with our manufacturer because this is something we really had to sell to many manufacturers. The larger ones, the Tysons and the Sara Lees, they were on board, but majority of them were still a little bit, you know, not too sure if this was the right thing for them. Right. So we we did we had what we call a top to top conference and we we went for a couple of days and we had meetings. We talked about the benefits from our side and the benefits mm. from their side. We brought in speakers. We had Malcolm Gladwell, of all people. Uh, oh, wow. Point. Yeah, it was our first speaker and he was very interesting. And, uh, you know, I became a real a fan of Malcolm Gladwell. But um, it's uh, just it, it, it got to that point. But on the other side. And I think the downside, and I want to talk about this a little bit, because when we rolled everything yeah. up, you do lose control, you know, and I think those right. of us that were, whether we're a single market broker or regional broker, you know, we had that control. You know, we loved the way we ran our companies. We had great people that bought into it. And now you're trying right. to get people to buy into a whole new culture. 
a whole new way of going to market. At the same time, there was, you know, a job elimination. You know, everything comes back to, you know, the dollar, the, the, the almighty dollar. You know, we've got to make a certain profit. So with that said, there were some great people uh, that, were, that were gone or they left on their own because they were pressured to, to, to perform at a certain level. So, I mean, there's, you know, there were pluses and minuses. And of course, you know, yeah, you had a Costa roll up and you've had some other retail companies that rolled into food service. Right. And I'm not saying it's wrong. Um, I think, you know, there's still a jury out there. There's still the place for the independent broker in my mind. I think anybody who yeah. performs and has that local market knowledge that the manufacturer needs and wants, have at it. They've got, they've still got great opportunities. The large guy, yeah. you know, sometimes the middle, the smaller and mid-sized principles get, get lost in the shuffle, you know, with a large broker. But Definitely. in some cases, they like that. Looking back, when you went from Food Sales West and then went national with Advantage Waypoint, would you do it all over again? Hmm. It's a good question. I, I probably, and at the time, based on what I knew, I, I probably would have done it, but I would have done it a little bit differently. I probably would not have rushed into it. And I think that was, there was, there was pressure. I think because the word was getting out and I think that was the other thing, other brokers who were looking to regional brokers that were looking to possibly roll up, they were here, they knew this was going on. And so there was pressure us to be first. And, you know, for whatever reason, you know, that was something that, came back and made a bit us a little bit, but at the same time, because we got the job done. But I probably, in, in looking back in retrospect, I probably would have taken my time and asked more questions because I think you get, you know, the excitement right. of it. It was exciting because, you know, here we were, uh, first of all, we were friends. Most of us were good friends. We talked about this for a, quite a long, you know, quite a period of time about rolling up and what it meant to all of us. But it also, you have to look at the impact of your overall company. Um, if we did it, if we didn't do it, Nick, I, we would have been a much smaller company. We, in my right. mind, to begin with, we would have, no, no doubt, we would have lost some major principles, and we would have been back in mm -hmm. that same situation where, how long can we can we you know endure this, and how fast can we add revenue, especially sizable revenue? So you know, I'm not saying I think it was it's good and bad. You know, I I have mixed 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 reaction or mixed emotions about it. Yeah. But at the same sure. time, you know, I mean, hey, I, the business, I love the way the business transgressed, the progression. And that's, I, I go back now and looking at this mm -hmm. business from, you know, I started in 1981 with Tyson. I was in the broker's business in 1985. And I look at where it's come. And now I look at, you know, people like yourself, you know, social media, what, what social media has meant. I mean, we, we didn't know what Twitter was or whatever. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, Zoom me, we, we didn't have Zoom meetings, you know. You know, we right. got a conference call and half the time, you know, people would drop off. You didn't even know if they were on the call. So it was it's right. an interesting time. And, you know, you've done a great job of bringing in new revenue and, you know, hiring great people. Yeah. And I think that's it, it's kind of gone full circle. And I think that this business, mm -hmm. you know, and I look at what happened. COVID. I mean, COVID has changed so much, you know, and I look at companies now that downsize and, you know, they don't have the the same First of all, they don't have the manpower. A lot of brokers can't afford mm -hmm. the manpower. You know, manufacturers aren't paying the revenue. Yet, it's still a relationship business, and in my mind, always will yeah. be. You know, I know centralization of distribution. Um, I had the fortune that last week, you pretty know, I had lunch with a fellow by the name of Frank Damani. Frank Damani was the president of Cisco San Francisco back in the eight nineties, eighties, nineties, and early two thousands, and he helped he helped keep our business afloat when we went through some tough times in. Uh, in the late eighties. But I talked to Frank and Frank says, you know, he says, you know, he, I, he says, I can't believe the business today. It, you know, nobody's in the office, distributor office, you know, mm -hmm. you can't get a hold of anybody. It's all done, you know, mm -hmm. from central central where it's Houston or whatever. They have a warehouse. Everybody's working out of their house. It's a whole different ball game today. And you know it better than anybody. Totally. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, the pandemic has really, uh, I think it advanced technology at a very rapid pace. And it changed the way that we do business, you know, the kind of the, you know, we like, I like to call it food service, but others are calling it now, you know, uh, away from home, Yeah. Um, you know, people working from home and the, it, 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 there's just so many um, different aspects to what we do and in the food service industry in general now, uh, just two years past the, the pandemic. Right, right. So I want to ask you, let me ask you, so far as the manpower now, because 
so much is centralized. And I mean, even like if you look at chain specialists, you know, and what have you in K-12, right. are there are channel specialists even needed today? Because, you know, you look at most of these decisions are coming out of one market. Yeah. So the way we're set up is we have specialists. So kind of what you just alluded to chains or K-12 or second and third tier dis uh, distribution. Um, so we do have specialists and then the, the, the rest of the team is built, um, based on where they live. So for example, we have some of that cover San Diego. So all the distributors and operators within San Diego, they take care of. Okay. Um, so that's kind of how we are built and we are, our, our big, uh, go to market strategy is around what we call the strategic account. So that's kind of a, like large impact operators. Think of like restaurant chains or casinos. And then it's also a mixture of second and third tier distributors, you know, cause you can go in there and present an item and, you know, next thing you know, they're buying pallets of whatever it may be. Right. Right. Um, so that's, and those strategic accounts are very important to what we do. Right. And, right. Uh, and the manufacturers we represent very much, uh, appreciate, you know, especially having the specialists as well in chains and K-12 right. because people want more connection. Uh, and more closeness to the to the end user. Right, exactly. Yeah. The other thing I was going to mention, you know, we if obviously facilities, you know, things we pride ourselves on, and you do too, is, you know, having a, 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 a great um, kitchen setup, you know, as far as a, a yeah. pro, you know, production center or whatever. And that was something that really came in handy because not only did we use it to in, bring customers in to show them menu concepts, but many times big customers used it for themselves for their own, you know, meetings or whatever. So, you know, facilities are still important. And I know that's something that's probably less and less today. And I know people are pulling out of probably some of their buildings or whatever, but you just never want to lose that one-on-one -on -one with a customer. Right. Of course. So you, you mentioned that, you, you know, you started as a door-to-door -door sales rep for Oscar Meyer, then you moved into a regional manager position with Tyson, and then you get into the broker business, eventually become an owner uh, you know, go out and buy a bunch of companies, then become national. What would be advice that you would give to somebody who is just starting out in food service, who, you know, maybe they're passionate, maybe they are uh, a hard driver, they're motivated. What was some lessons that hmm. you've learned along the way or advice that you would give to somebody in that situation? Well, the first one would be sow your oats. I mean, I think that, I think there's a lot of people today that I don't want to use the word entitled, but I will. But you got to you got to yeah. earn your stripes. I mean, I learned it. I learned it from the ground up. I mean, I didn't mention my actually my first job when I was in high, in high school was making del deli sandwiches, grinders back in the East Coast. You being an you the East nice. Coast guy, grinders, yeah. So I mean, that's I learned from the ground up, and I think that be willing to learn all you can about the business because you know it's ever changing. But you know, don't be stuck in and if, and if you feel like you know you're isn't stuck in one position. There's so many opportunities out there in food service today, you know, whether it's in the restaurant business, the broker's business, distribution business. Um, and I, 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 you know, it's gotten, and it's funny because, you know, I think back and maybe still today, it's still looked at food service, maybe being kind of, you know, not a trendy thing, you know, especially if you go to work at the, at the restaurant business, but there are so many successful people today that started. That's how they started. They started McDonald's or they started, in the trenches somewhere, you know, driving a truck or what have you. But I think that today it's, you know, first of all, <laughs> be on top of technology. Uh, number one, uh, I mm -hmm. think that's so critical today. Uh, you know, it's funny. We had people when we first going back in the eighties, I mean, we didn't, you know, email wasn't even a thing back then, but you know, you try to get people to try to do emails or look at you know, stocking guides on their computer and you're up at midnight, you know, mm -hmm. showing them how to do it. But you know, technology's mm -hmm. come so far. Um, you know, I think it's it's just it, it's easy. First of all, you got to be hungry, and you know, if you're going to commit to something, commit to it 100. Um, percent You know, it, 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 and if you realize, hey, life's too short. If you realize that it's not what you want to do, you know, to go do something else. But I would give it a 100 percent effort. And you've got people like yourself, your dad. There's so many people around to talk to. That's the other thing is talk to people. You know, I, I find that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess maybe you know, I'm older, but I found that a lot of the younger employees were afraid to talk or they felt like they knew it all in some cases. Hmm. And I look at people and I tried to do this when I was younger. I'm sure I didn't do it all the time, but I, I love talking to 
experienced people. I love people talking to people right. who are had been around a business. I learned so much from them. You know, it's it's like right. everything else. You know, it's just the 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 philosophies. And even though business change, you know, they're going to give you some just hard life advice, which to me is so important. Right. You know, and I think that's it. But if it's not in your heart, you know, you. you then you might as well do something else. But it's a great business, a lot of growth opportunities. I mean, I look at my career, yeah. and, you know, I never thought I'd be in the brokerage business. In fact, I never thought I'd be in sales. Yeah. I'll give you an example. Am I, <laughs> yeah. I was, I, I was, I was, I was shy, a shy young guy. I, I, I didn't, my, my dad was a salesman. He was, he was like a tin man. He did everything from baby furniture to aluminum siding. And I told I him when it. I was six, 16, 17, I was going to get in a sales business. And I, once again, I met a guy from Oscar Meyer, threw me into the fray. Mm -hmm. And before you knew it, I was out selling bacon and hot dogs and little Smokies. And uh, now look what happened. Yeah. You know, but it's a it's it's a great business. Yeah, exactly. It really is. And, you know, I mean, it's just uh, you learn from your dad, you learn from your brothers and uh, you got to reach out to other people. And if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask. Yep. You know, people aren't going to. One hundred percent. Yep. So that's that'd be my advice. But hey, we need more good, strong people in the business. Totally. And, and when you look back on your career, is there any, is there a defining moment or a moment in time that sticks out to you and something that you'll remember forever? Well, I, I alluded to the comment from Don Tyson and I, I'll never forget that because I, I could see it today. I mean, it's like it was like it happened yesterday, you know, just don't be afraid right. to take risks, you know, and, you know, and I think that's something. And Carl was the same way. I mean, Carl, you know, I look at Carl, I, you know, God rest his soul and some of the decisions he made. You know, here's a guy that fired one of his biggest lines. He fired riches. Right. And it, it was a shock around the country. Everybody go, how do you do that? But he realized it was not, first of all, he, he, it wasn't profitable. He couldn't, he, he couldn't meet their demands based on, you know, revenue and all that. Yet nobody else would do that. They would have gone and said, well, we'll just bite the bullet and we'll do it. But I think that, um, you know, those are life lessons. I'm, I've learned a lot along the way, Nick. I mean, it's just, and every, right. everywhere I go, I think from most of them were from, People that, you know, I knew, you know, brokers that we bought just sitting around over dinner or having a cocktail or whatever and just talking to them. And, you know, and I think uh, that that's what makes life so, so interesting, you know, and it's don't have the attitude like, you know, at all. I mean, because if you get to the if you get to that point, you say, I don't need help or I don't you know, I don't need any assistance. You might as well pack it in. Exactly. So. Exactly. Well, Dave, I, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me and be on the be on uh, the podcast. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I always learn so much from you. So, thank you for sharing, and uh, thank you for coming on today. Well, thank you, Nick. I really appreciate it. It was great. It was, it was a great experience for me, and uh, I learned a lot myself over the last few days just thinking about the, the business. So, thanks for <laughs> thanks for all the memories. Of course, thank you so much, Dave. 